Once again, before getting into the lesson, I want to express to the elders of this fine congregation my deep appreciation for their dedication to the truth and being exemplary for their sacrificial spirit and life in keeping the church the Lord's church. Seems to me if you sum up the elders' work and you as shepherds, it's to keep the church the Lord's church and to make it function in the best way it possibly can in the church's duty to preach and defend the gospel. And we appreciate the elders here. They've been very supportive of me. And you know, I knew of them before, however long ago it was, I ever came here and knew of their reputation. But over the years, I got to know Brother, now Brother Brantley and Brother Stancliffe. And I've grown to love them and appreciate their care for the truth. We are certainly mindful of Brother Stancliffe's illness. I want him to know how much we love both of you and how much we're praying for him and for everybody at this congregation. And we trust in God's good providential care. You'll be able to grow spiritually and hopefully sow the seed of the kingdom and reach many people in this area. To Michael and Karen, I just uh, don't know how to say how much friends they are to us. I say us, uh, I think Jody and Karen, if they had time to be around one another, would hit it off. And one time they were some, but uh, I think they hit it off very well. Michael's a dear friend, faithful gospel preacher, and done a great work here, and does wherever he is. And I look over this audience, I see several of you who mean so much to me and the cause of Christ. And our fellowship in the Lord is so important to us. And yet that fellowship to be what it ought to be must be according to the authority of God's Word. And that's what this whole lesson is about and the whole lectureship is about. When you talk about innovations, you're talking about people introducing things that are not authorized by Jesus Christ in His New Testament. And tonight we want to deal with the matter of mechanical instrumental music in the worship of God. Now I would like for us, first of all, just simply to turn and read the Scriptures that are in the last will and testament of our sovereign, the Lord Jesus Christ, regarding what it has to say about music and worship. And first of all, we notice in Matthew 26, 30, and that would also take into consideration Mark 14, 26, and when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. In Acts 16, verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed <clears throat> and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul declares, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Then in Ephesians 5, verse 19, to the church at Ephesus, he wrote, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then much the same thing to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3 and verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and demonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And then chapter 13, verse 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, and the last, uh, James 5 and verse 13, is any merry, let him sing psalms. Now you know in my training back years ago as trying to know how to study history, you have what's called secondary co uh, sources and research, and you have what's called primary sources. Primary sources are uh, diaries and letters written by people and notes they wrote and maybe even books they wrote. Uh, but that's primary because if you're studying the history of this person or a certain situation in which this person was involved, then that's getting about as close as you can get. Now, in recent times, that might be recordings. But nevertheless, you're trying to get as close as you can to the people who lived in past time and space to get as factually as you can concerning those people and events and things. Well, let me ask you something. If you're going to study anything pertaining to genuine, pure, primitive, we would say New Testament Christianity, 
then wouldn't you say, in view of what the New Testament claims for itself and what we can prove it to be, the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final, complete Holy Spirit-inspired Word of the living God that is given to us to instruct us, wouldn't you say the New Testament would be the place to go to get the primary information needed? Well, I don't know why that wouldn't be the answer. So that's what we do. Now, we've read every scripture the Holy Spirit recorded for us in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to know when we read that, do you find anything mentioning any other kind of music whereby God had the, uh, mentioned to the church worship other than S-I-N-G? You don't. And when you know that the, Jesus is an absolute monarch whose word is law, and this is his last will and testament, then you know what he wants. And if people had honest and good hearts, which is a prerequisite to any other study of hermeneutics, that is how to interpret the scripture, to get out of it, don't know what God put in it, not read anything into it. If people had that first requisite, an honest and good heart, that hungered and thirsted after righteousness, that would end it all right there, because they can't find anything else in the New Testament about any other kind of music and worship to God other than sing. Now, do you know of anybody that engages in any other kind of music and worship to God who would say that it is a sin to worship God by singing when it comes to music? I don't find that. The problem is, is that, well, will this hurt if we use this? Will God be pleased if we use some other kind of music? Also, it has to do with the attitude we take toward the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. How do we approach the Bible? Well, of course, it's studying to show ourselves to prove to God we must do what Paul called to Timothy, rightly dividing, or as the American Standard has it, handling a right, the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And therefore, you've got to understand how to handle rightly the word of God. Well, a lot of people nowadays are handling the Word of God deceitfully because they're saying that it is not a divine pattern. They're saying it is not an authoritative book. They're saying that it is not a place you go to to determine specific things you must do, and if you don't do them, you sin, or specific things that you, that you must leave undone or omit, and if you go ahead and leave them undone, you sin. No, you can't approach the Bible that way. We're seeing that they call it some sort of inspired historical uh, meta-narrative. Uh, coming up with all these terms. Well, what they mean by that is, is that it just narrates the events pertaining to Christianity when it started back in the first century, and that's all you can say about the New Testament. There's not necessarily anything authority, uh, authoritative in it that would cause us to have to do anything that's anything there that, uh, that's obligatory, but then you turn around and say, well, must a person believe in God, the God of the Bible? Well, yeah, probably so. But some people would say even then, well, we're so weighted down by our human frailties that uh, God knows that, and he'd probably love to take us to heaven anyway. And of course, you got the Universalist Unitarian. He said, make a difference how you live. God loves us so much, you're going to heaven anyway. And what does that do to encourage anybody to study the Bible, to find out how to live, what to do and what not to do? And then you've got others who say, well, really in this uh, historical narrative, all it does is tell us that man's lost. He did it to himself. He can't save himself. God loves him so much. He gave his son to die for him. And if you will know that and acknowledge that, everything's else all right. Now, if you bind anything else on anybody that they must do to be saved, then you're some sort of legalist. And that's about it. And if you will notice, every one of these people come up with these wild ideas to keep from doing what the book says. They want to have more leeway to do as they please. That's always been the problem. How early did it begin? Well, it really began with Eve. Then it started the next step with Cain. You know, Cain worshipped. He took the time to build an offer, take what he took, and offer it. He worshipped. Well, it would have been acceptable to God according to the way people view things nowadays. 
but he didn't do as he was told to do, as God commanded him. And so it is that if we have people like that, then you can't begin to talk about, well, what kind of music does God authorize that we must use that God's well pleased with our worship when it comes to singing. They say that's not even a question that needs to be asked. All you've got to do is just know from the meta narrative that He loves you, you're a sinner, Christ saves you, acknowledge that, and want Him to save you. Everything else is just any way you want to do it to show your love for God and devotion to God and worship to God, and it's all right. Now, a lot of times, if we're going to get somebody to study with us, we've got to destroy that false concept of the New Testament, or you'll never get the first base on what must I do to be saved. In fact, you will not get the first base on showing much of anything is obligatory on anybody. As long as they acknowledge the love of God, their lost condition, and they can't be saved, and Christ will save them. That's about it. Now, keeping that in mind, that's the first thing you need to do in being able to, to study and learn the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, indeed, in your actions. And something will happen. Ye shall know the truth. Now, why is that important? And the truth shall make you free. And that's being free from sin, the guilt of sin. Well, does that encompass the kind of music God wants? Or can you just use a guitar or organ or tambourine or whatever else and say, I'm doing this to the glory of God, and he'll accept it because you're sincere in what you believe, though you can't find, as we read, anything in the New Testament about any kind of music whereby God's worship except S-I-N-G-C. Well, what are we really saying? First of all, we are not. We are not affirming that all music is sinful. We are not affirming that all mechanical music is sinful. We're not affirming that even all instrumental music is sinful. We are also not concerned with the music that was employed in the worship of God in the Old Testament. And there's a simple reason for that. Jesus now has all authority in heaven and on earth, and we have his last will and testament, since he no longer walks this earth, to tell us what his will is. And he's the one who said, if you love me, I honk my horn. No, he said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And it's Jesus who is the sovereign monarch whose word is law. And where's that word found? In the New Testament. We've already seen the kind of music mentioned there when it comes to worship God. So we're noticing we're not under anything that pertains to the Old Testament as far as authority as to how we ought to live at all. We do learn from the Old Testament that when you love God and keep his commandments, he blesses you. When you disobey him, he punishes you. And thus, that's one way that the Old Testament benefits us today under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. So we need to know then that we're not paying attention to what went on in the Old Testament from the standpoint of saying, see, they used this. They were acceptable to God. We can use it. We'll be acceptable to God. We're under the last will and testament of Christ. And if you know what a will is, it's enforced, the writer of Hebrews said, after a man's dead. Then it becomes authoritative. That's the reason Christ could say to the thief while he's alive, the thief on the cross, that today you'll be with me in paradise. Christ could forgive sins as he saw fit so to do while he walked this earth. But you can't say that today to somebody and say, well, he saved the thief. He'll save me the same way. No, he doesn't walk this earth any longer. His will is manifested in the words of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. That's why we went there and read those words a while ago pertaining to all you can find in the New Testament concerning music, and it's S-I-N-G-C. We are under authority of Christ, to Christ as it's set out in the words of the New Testament. Matthew 28, 18, James 1, 25, and of course, Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. And if you just took John 12, 48, that would be enough to say we must do only what the New Testament teaches us because it tells us it's Jesus does and it's the standard whereby we will be judged in the last day. So it will read and mean the same thing on the day of judgment it, as it reads and means now. In other words, the kind of music acceptable to God now in worship is going to be the same kind of music we'll be 
uh, judged by in the New Testament on the day of judgment as to whether we've engaged in it or whether we have not, whether we've been right in the use of it or have abused it and misused it. Furthermore, we're not concerned with what may or may not be used in worship of God in heaven when it comes to what God authorizes us to do here on earth. Titus 2, 11 through 12. Brethren, I don't know what all will be done in heaven any more than anybody else does. Just to know that there will be no marriage in heaven for we will be as the angels ought to tell us how radical a change it's going to be in heaven. So we need to realize that we need to be proving to God we love Him and that we have faith in Him and His system of salvation and His instruction in the work organization and worship of the church of which music is one of those things he's commented on and is our subject this evening, and by showing him that we're going to abide by his will and his last will and testament. Well, the New Testament then addresses mankind's spiritual needs while he is still in the flesh on this earth and not when he's glorified with Christ in heaven. 1 John 3, 2. So we prove to God we love him when on this earth his will is carried out even as whatever his will is carried out in heaven. Therefore, in this study, we are affirming all mechanical instruments of music used in the worship of God are sinful. Also, singing is the only kind of music the New Testament authorizes to be used in the worship of God and I could add on to that when it comes to music. Now you keep in mind, in your own mind, all of those scriptures, and there's not that many of them, in the New Testament that comments upon music as it relates to the work of God. And it's just seen. It's just seen. I would say that if you're going to have somebody that doesn't believe that, and they start coming up and doing this, that, and the other, just say, well, all you find in the New Testament, and that's our Lord's will, is sing. Now, they're going to come and say, but, 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 like Billy Goat, but, 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 and he got it. Well, the thing of it is that they don't respect the authority of the Scriptures. There's the problem. We have, we're having all this problem. Moral matters throughout the whole land, this country. Spiritual matters. People have no more respect for this Bible than they do uh, last year's newspaper. They just don't. It's been played down for years. So it was always a problem to get people to understand how the Bible authorizes when it came especially to the music God has authorized whereby he wants to be worshipped. Back when people still believed the Bible was authoritative and you had to do what the Bible said. People had a hard time understanding that. Well, that was back in the day when the denominations, they didn't know anything about rightly dividing the word of truth. But they respected the Bible as the word of God. Today, that's not even so. That's the reason I started off by pointing out that when you begin to engage in the study of the Bible with anybody, you better understand his view of its authority. You better understand what he understands about rightly dividing the word of truth and his appreciation of authority in general. For those who believe the Bible to be the Word of God, the question is, I said earlier, is not whether singing is wrong or not, but whether they can engage in some other kind of music and thereby remain as pleasing to God as we know we are when we sing and only sing and worshiping Him when it comes to music. We do not hesitate to say we only know the will of Christ by the words of Christ. And that's all anybody else can say. It's the words of Christ wherein we find the will of Christ and thus the authority of Christ set out for us. Thus to use some of the kind of music then that found on the pages of the New Testament is to act contrary to his word and thereby reject what he's authorized on that matter. Now, let me look just for a moment at what the New Testament passages on singing really teach us. In Ephesians 5.19, we learn not only that singing is authorized is as a part of worship, but also that congregational singing is authorized. We are to speak to one another as we sing praise to God. It's not that we 
have a solo where somebody performs. And let me pause here and say this. That's another problem with the worship. People are saying we're going to worship God, but what they're really doing is entertaining one another and saying God will have to like it because that's what we like and we're going to do it because the Bible doesn't really specify anything or is very authoritative. It just tells us the love of God. As I said earlier, our need of Him and our hearts are in the right place. So whatever we do, that's all acceptable is worship to God. Same would be true of our service. But we're to speak to one another when we are engaged in uh, the authorized music of the New Testament in worship as we sing praise to God. And notice that to comply with the teaching of this passage, Ephesians 5.19, that each individual, each individual worshiper must participate in that melody made in each heart of each worshiper who knows what the words of those songs are. You know, that means that we have to pay attention to what we're doing. I might ask uh, Paul here, since we're to do all things by the authority of the Lord, and I can't find explicitly in the New Testament anywhere there was a song leader leading the congregation and singing, are you authorized? <laughs> well, you know, just simply, let's see. We're to do all things decently and in order. You know, we need a song leader at least to tell us what song we're singing and to get us started and to keep us going together and to get us stopped. Yes, a song leader is authorized as an expedient to carry out in the worship of God when it comes to singing, things being done in the singing that's decently and in order. You just authorize the songbook too. Because it helps us do only what God has obligated us in His authoritative word to do. It adds no other kind of music to any of it. It helps you accomplish what God said we're to do. Just like the microphone and so on. Mechanical instruments of music and all other music but singing violates God's law of faith. The inspired Hebrews writer penned that faith is essential to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please Him. Also we are taught to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, we're to walk by faith, we're to walk as the Word of God instructs us to walk or to live. Not as things appear to our five senses. It comes by hearing the word of God. Why? That's a statement of fact. Well, why does my confidence in God and the gospel system to save me come by hearing the word? Well, hearing there means I understand the word. And in my understanding that's been enlightened by what these words communicate to me, then I know that Christ is the Son of God. And all the other things pertaining to Christianity is true. Well, then it comes down to worship too, doesn't it? And the New Testament instructs us about that. And so it is that to worship God by faith means we worship as the Word of God leads, guides, and directs us. And when it comes to music, and let's see, how many kinds of music did we read of in the New Testament long ago? We saw seeing when it came to worshiping God. Thus, to walk by faith is to walk as the Word of God leads and guides and directs or authorizes us to walk. And listen, since mechanical instrumental music is not a part of the teaching of the New Testament, the last will and testament of Jesus, our King, whose Word is law, we cannot, we must not engage in it, and we cannot engage in it by faith, because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And when it comes to the kind of music, the only kind that's there is singing. Any other kind is just not found in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. So it's a sin to use it in the worship of God because it's not worshiping God in truth. And yet when you continue in His Word, you'll know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. What's the truth about music when it comes to worshiping God in the Lord's church under the authority of the New Testament of Christ. How many different kinds of music did we read of in the New Testament concerning the worship of God? One, and that's S-I-N-G. 
Mechanical instruments of music violates God's law of worship. Some people don't know there is any law of any kind, much less a law of worship. No religious service is acceptable to God. I say again, for I don't know how many times I've said it, it's not authorized by God's word. John 4, 24, 17, 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Colossians 3, 17, I've already quoted. Now notice that the New Testament speaks of four, no less of four different types of kinds of worship and only one of them is pleasing to God. Matthew 15, 9, Jesus condemned vain worship, pointless worship, empty worship. He, can, uh, he uh, mentions, Paul does, in Acts 17 and verse 23, he mentions ignorant worship. They don't know what they're doing. Colossians 2, 23, will worship. I think that covers a great deal of the worship of people today. That's what we like, and we will do it. And then John 4, 24, our Lord talks about true worship, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. In spirit, it comes from the heart. Our minds are what we're doing. We're directing our worship to God as the last one in Testament of Christ instructs us to engage in those acts of worship. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I just sit there and worship in my heart and I didn't open my mouth. Folks, you've got to have the heart right. In your mind, you must be thinking about God and you must be offering your acts of worship to Him. But you've got to engage in the act. And you can't sing without singing. Some of us, I'm afraid, are sort of like folks in the casket. Our lips are so shut already before the time. Well, you're sinning when you do that. That's what people don't understand. Well, I just can't sing. Yes, you can make some racket. I don't know of anybody that has to be a operatic singer that's trained all his life before God accepts it. But if you know you're a child of the living God and you love him, then you'll keep his commandments. And one of those commandments, as you put together the totality, the information of the New Testament, in worship to God is sing. And you'll do your best to sing. All singing through the years hasn't been four-part harmony. But nevertheless, you engage in what the Lord said we're to do, sing. Well, I don't want to. Well, then just sit there and sin and lose your soul. Not any different than that. And Eve taking what she took from, from the coercion of the devil and eating it and sinning. Not a bit of difference. So only singing in the worship of God when it comes to music is according to His Word, which is the truth. Mechanical instrumental music violates God's law of unity. The use of it causes, watch it, unnecessary division. Now, you know there's authorized division, and then uh, there's unauthorized division, as there is authorized unity and unauthorized unity. On matters wherein the authority of God has obligated us to do certain things in order to be saved or in order to be faithful to remain saved, we cannot change that. It's just that way. And so we must understand for people to say, well... We can do all these different things different ways and leave some of it undone and alter it all when God said you must do it this way and the way I said it. The reason I said it, we have no business saying, well, we can still have unity. You can't have scriptural unity that God acknowledges except that you abide by the authority of His Word as that New Testament authorizes. After all, we do acknowledge Him as Lord of Lord, King of Kings. He has all authority. Well, if He does, do what He said. It's that simple. Do what he said, and we may say this more later. Do what he said in the way he said it for the reason, and sometimes there's more than one reason that he said it, that you can be sure you've obeyed him. After all, the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and do as you please. That seems to be the way people interpret it, whether they would quote it that way or not. No, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole the sum and substance of our being as creatures of God on this earth is to prove to God we love Him, we have faith in His system, and you try to do that without obeying Him. See how far you get. Imagine somebody saying, oh, I have great belief in God, in Christ's gospel system, and I love Him with all that I am, but I'm not, I'm not going to do a thing He says. 
But I'll prove to him I love him and I have faith in him. Well, how would you do that? How would you show God you love him, you have faith in him and his system of salvation and not do what he said, the way he said, the reason he said? Can't do it. And that's the reason James wrote, and by the way, he wrote that to Christians, not the denominational people, although it applies. He said, faith without works is dead being alone. But he also said, you show me your faith apart from your works. Works of obedience. And I'll show you my faith by my works. Works of obedience. And that's the way all of us do it. We show our faith in God and the gospel system and everything about God by obedience to his will, which shows our faith because faith can't show itself any other way. Now think about that. It just can't. Then there's a mechanical instrument, uh, instrumental music violating God's law of inclusion. God's law of inclusion. Now that law means that when God has specifically authorized a thing, it's included. If the thing's not authorized, it's excluded. I don't think this is difficult for us to understand. I've used this illustration all over the place. We have restrooms in this building. They have something like male on one or female on another, or men on one, women on the other, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, girls and boys in the public schools. When it says woman, you know, you have to define your terms there. We all know what a woman is. When it says men, we can define our terms and know what that means. Now, whatever that means in the way that we represent who can go in that restroom and view what a restroom is, and that includes, it includes the men, or if it's women, the women. Because the authorization is said in that one word on the door. Now who's excluded? Those not authorized. Those not authorized when we define the term. And I hope that we know what a man is and what a woman is. Although in this nation, that tends to be more clouded all the time with some people. Now you know what? Do you want to learn the law of exclusion and forever remember it? Let some man trot right on into the door that says, won't know. He will know the law of exclusion. Now, I use that because it's a bit simple and funny, but it illustrates exactly how the word in its authority includes well if you're not authorized you're not included if you're not authorized you're excluded mechanical instrument of music violates god's law of silence regarding our actions the holy spirit through the apostle john prohibits us from going beyond what is written in the new testament it, it almost seems that when you've got something like that that just people are determined to go ahead and do right the opposite Tell them they can't and they're going to try. You can't find written in the New Testament that anyone is to use mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God or to make some sound with the human voice that mimics that kind of thing. If you define singing, then you know that it's not humming. Because the kind of singing acceptable, such as Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, means that by the words and the meaning of them and you sing the song you're instructing those sitting around you i don't i mean you know you can say mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all you want to and um, i don't think that instructs anybody probably makes people wonder about you a little bit they've probably been doing that already anyway we must realize that a word authorizes us to do only what it includes <coughs> however a word does not preclude Listen to me. It does not preclude or prevent anticipated action. Neither does a word interdict or declare authoritatively against things it does not include. Let me give you what I mean by that. When it says sing, you define it. <coughs> you know that includes singing. But that within itself does not necessarily exclude playing. Here's why. If you had the Holy Spirit saying sing in one passage... You know, you're to take the totality of all the Bible says before you draw your conclusion. But over here, you have a passage saying that they played. If you take the position that singing excludes, and what are you going to do about the passage that says play? That's not the way they interpret the Bible. 
What you would have then, if such were so, and it's not, would be seeing and play. Just like believe and baptize. Now the people have a problem with that when it comes to the plan of salvation. They say, oh, if to be saved, believe on Jesus Christ. And you bring up baptized, they say, no, just believe, and that's all there is to it. But you say the same Bible with that coordinated conjunction and makes the belief and the baptism equal in their authority to what a man must believe and do. So why do you take belief to the exclusion of baptism? Well, we understand that when it comes to that and arguments with people and exposing false doctrine. But we try to say, well, the singing excludes. Well, there's a way you can interpret that and make it exclude because the mechanical music is not included in the definition of the word singing. But you can't just say it excludes something else, some other kind of music. The reason it excludes it, there's not any other kind of music mentioned in the New Testament. And thus we rest with singing, and we rest upon inspired solid ground that no man can refute. And we need to understand that uh, about how the Bible does those things. i got a couple of minutes probably. I will mention, and I want you to read these, I, there's a... I think, I think I can say this. If you want to see somebody that anticipated and recorded all of these different arguments people attempt to make to justify mechanical instrumental music, pick up J.D. Bale's book on it, and he has them all in there. There are some others out there, too, that do that. But, of course, in this chapter, I couldn't do all of that. But I did include three. And uh, I won't have time to go through all those, but I urge you to look at what they try to offer to justify their use of some other kind of music other than singing. Now, what we've done, and if we were in a debate, we'd even be more specific on this. <clears throat> what we've done is say, look, all that the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior and our sovereign King has to say about singing and worship to God, or music in the worship to God, is seen. As I said in the beginning, that ought to satisfy anybody and to be on safe ground. You just do what you're authorized in music and worship to God and what is every verse in the Bible we read as far as the New Testament and it's seen. Now that would satisfy anybody. We have to spend this time as we're done somewhat here tonight on it because so many people have tried to say, well, singing is fine. I have no problem with it. But can't we do some more other kind of singing? There's the problem. No. We do only what's included. What's included is the kind of music that is called singing, and we can define it, and we can know what it is, and we know that's the will of Christ manifested in the words of Christ, and all we can find in the last will and testament of Christ when it comes to the worship of God and music is sing, and we're going to be judged by that book. And these things we've studied tonight will read and mean then just like they read and mean now. So I don't hesitate to say that singing is the only kind of music acceptable to God when it comes to worshiping Him. Period. Yeah, but. You don't have any grounds for yeah, but. It's your heart, the problem, and not being satisfied with the thus saith the Lord on the matter. And there's where the problem always has been. Think about it for a minute. In the Garden of Eden, one commandment. And look what trouble Eve had with that. So when it comes down to something like do only what's authorized in the word of Christ, he's the sovereign Lord, and when you read every scripture it says sing, then I'm content with singing because that's what's authorized and that's what, what's right. And he tests my faith by seeing if I will comply with the truth set out in the word of truth because the word of God creates faith. And that's just it. Go ahead and study these things. There's a lot more there. But I tell you now, before you try to refute any false doctrine, know what the book says as far as the truth is concerned. And it won't change. One of the things is this. When you present an affirmative speech, if you've done it like it ought to be and you are affirming the truth, when that four-night debate's over with, it'll still be the truth and that fellow's done everything he could do. Because after all, he's affirming a false doctrine. He can't be using any scripture right because it doesn't teach error. Thank you.